In October term 2022, the Supreme Court released blockbuster opinions on affirmative action, free speech, immigration, and more. Depending on who you ask, this court is an extremist conservative juggernaut or liberal apologist. I'd like to argue today that a lot of the myths around the media's coverage of the Supreme Court from the right and the left aren't quite right. The Supreme Court decided 58 cases. Half of those were decided unanimously, and nine out of 10 of them were decided with at least one liberal justice in the majority. Only five cases, 8%, were decided 6-3 with the six Republican appointees all on one side and the three Democratic appointees on the other. And that was the lowest number of ideologically split decisions in the past six years. For yet another year, Justice Kavanaugh was in the majority most often, 96% of the time. Chief Justice Roberts was next at 95% of the time. And Justice Barrett was in the majority 91% of the time. And who were the least likely to be in the majority? Justices Thomas and Alito. These facts lead me to make a few observations. First, it's clear that political ideology doesn't explain the outcome of the vast majority of Supreme Court decisions. If you take out the unanimous cases, the three liberal justices voted together in fewer than a quarter of the cases. And the six conservatives voted together only 17% of the time. But if political ideology doesn't explain these voting patterns, what does? I think of it as two axes. At the bottom, there's the political valence of a case. But for those who study the court closely, it's hard to say that Justice Gorsuch, for example, is more conservative than Justice Kavanaugh. So why aren't they voting the same way? Because there's a second axis, and it's capturing institutional concerns, meaning they disagree on how to think about precedent or whether the effects of the outcome of a case should matter, or which rules to apply when words are ambiguous. So instead of being a 6-3 conservative majority, the court is more like 3-3-3. Three, three, three. Another thing I hear is that, sure, the court may be unanimous in some cases, but on the important ones, it's all political. Right off the bat, we have to ask what makes a case important? Is it the number of people affected? Is it the economic impact? I don't think there's a right answer to this question, but if you define important as the most politically divisive, then it doesn't really do us a lot of good. The Supreme Court, for example, struck down the Biden administration's student loan debt forgiveness plan. Six justices said they didn't think that's what Congress meant when it said the Secretary of Education could waive or modify federal student loans. And more importantly, Congress could forgive these debts whenever they wanted to. It's just that the president couldn't do it without clearer congressional authorization. Now that was a 6-3 case, and by nearly any measure, an important one. But now let's take the next example. The court also held that states couldn't sue to force President Biden to deport illegal aliens who had been convicted of crimes while in the United States. Also sounds pretty important, right? That case was decided 8-1, but it barely got any attention. The Supreme Court had three cases about how to deal with racial discrimination. The court upheld Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which requires states to consider race in creating congressional districts. The court upheld the Indian Child Welfare Act, which gave adoption placement preferences based on tribal status. And it struck down Harvard and North Carolina's race-based admissions policies. But only the last case got major headlines. Hopefully you're getting my point. There were plenty of big, important cases this term that didn't divide along that bottom axis, but they didn't get much attention. The politically divisive cases did. And they were often mischaracterized, telling voters that somehow the court isn't legitimate anymore. But disagreeing with the outcome of a Supreme Court decision isn't the same as the court being illegitimate. And if we as a nation just stop listening to the Supreme Court, the only thing left is pure majority rule, tyranny by whoever has power in the moment with no protections for the rest of us. I can't think of a faster way to end our 247-year experiment in self-government.